Engineering in Henri Nance, Atlantic, France. Professor of Corporate Anatomy and Professor at Henri's Vet. Advisor of Doctoral three Thesis in Veterinary Medicine and Head of Comparative Anatomy Unit. A member of the Scientific Commission and the Zoo, Techno Zoo Technical and Standards Commission of the French Kennel Club and a member of the FCI Standards Commission. Hola, buenos días, buenas tardes todos. Well, I think I will speak in English this afternoon because the, the, the organizers asked me to speak in English. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear organizers, dear Mr. President, dear friends, it's a great honor for me to be here in front of you, and it's also a great pleasure. I will talk about hypertypes in dogs. This presentation, as member of the standards, FCI Standards Commission, will be in a general context, the context of the standards. I know tomorrow, tomorrow Jorge Nayem, president of the FCI Standards Commission, will talk about standards. So I will just present some the context, the general context of the standard, the type, and the hypertype. The standard is supposed to describe the archetype of a specific breed. Instead of this traditional notion, we now prefer to say that the standard is a description of a specimen that can appear as an ideal of a breed. All standards are established according to a precise model which describes the history, the general aspect, the important proportion, the head, the body, the limb, the tail, the character, the gait. You know all of this for the standard. A short story about standards, you know. In the antique book by Gaston Phoebus, published in the 14th, at the end of the 14th century, there are detailed descriptions if not of breeds, at least of well-defined types. The three types of alum, gentles, over, and for butcher. It describes the head, the muzzle, the nose, the neckline, the body, the limbs, the coat colors. He also mentioned the testicles. It also describes the characters and the ways of hunting. Sorry. And a little bit later, it was de Banton, a famous naturalist, doctor, and above all, the first curator of the Museum of Natural History in Paris, who published in 1786 a very play, precise description of the breeds known at that time. Raymond Triquet, in 2017, also wrote with de Banton, the description of canine breeds taped on a scientific dimension. This author from the second half of the 18th century, however, does not mention height or weight, rarely the eyes, but details like the head, face, ears, neck, body, legs, tails. Those works, which are not the only ones to describe breeds, British literature also as examples, can be considered as the first standards. What is in the standards what we call the type? The type, coming from the Latin typus, which means model, symbol, is a set of distinctive characteristics common to all the individuals componing a breed. And it is what we can see straight away each breeze you have here. And now, hypertypes, standard and hypertypes. The interpretation is necessary if we want to give rise to diverse phenotypes. And why not surprising or interesting one? In summary, if we want the genetic variability of a breed to be expressed. The standard must therefore not lock the selection into an overly rigid yoke. But as soon as we 
favor the exaggeration of one of the features mentioned in the standard, we are moving toward the hypertype and diverging from the standard. If we refuse to accept a dog with lack of type, which lacks type, we should, if we are logical, refuse a hypertype dogs too. For example, you have here in the middle the, type, the typical dog. On the left, the dog that lacks type, and on the right, and an equal distance of the one of the middle, you have the hypertyped or hypertypical dog. So it's an illustration of what we call hypertype. What is very interesting is to see that the canine type is a notion of intrapopulation variability, of the genetic variability. And you can see here from insufficient dog, sufficient, good dog, very good and best of breed, all the distribution of the animals. Normally, all the animals in blue and green here are in the standard. They are according to the standard. They are in the type, what we call in the type. But those who are here in this part of the graphic are, have lack of type. And what is very important is to see that the pink part of this graphic correspond to hypotype here and hypertype here. And the difficulty is to know exactly where is this boundary, this limit between the best of the breed and the hypertype, hypertypical animal. It's a very big difficulty we have in judging animal in breeding animals because this boundary, this limit, is not imposed by the standard. It is a limit not to be beyond, but how to you how to know where it is. I will take a small example to express what I want to, to say here. For example, in brachycephalic dogs, if we study three different breeds. I will take three examples. I will take the breed dog de Bordeaux, I will take the French Bulldog, and I will take the Pug. You will understand the difficulty to know exactly this limit. If we consider the craniofacial ratio, it means the ratio between the muzzle, the face of the animal, and the cranium. In dog de Bordeaux, the mean value here is about 0.4. It means that animals with a craniofacial ratio of 0.4 are in the middle of the population. Here, we are a craniofacial ratio of about 0.3. It's animal which are come into the hypertype in this breed. And here we are with animal with longer muzzle and their craniofacial ratio is about 0.5. So you see for dog de Bordeaux breed, the limit here between the best of the breed in terms of craniofacial ratio and the hypertype animals, it's around 0.5. Point three. Now, if we consider the same graphics for the French Bulldog. In French Bulldog, the craniofacial ratio is about 0.2 and 0.15. It means that this here corresponds to 0.2, more or less, or a little bit less. The animals here are around 0.1. There are short nodes. 
And here, the animals are around 0.3, and they are in a light of, of type with muzzle uh, which are uh, longer. We see straight away that with these two breeds, the limit is not the same because it was 0.3 for the dog de Bordeaux, and it's now 0.1 for the uh, French Bulldog. And if we consider now the third breed, I, I said with the pug, in the pug, more or less, the mean value is around 0 0.1. The hypertypical animals are under 0 0.1 for the craniofacial ratio, and here, more than 0 0.2, we are in like of type. So you can see 0.3 for dog de Bordeaux, 0.2 for the French Bulldog, and 0, under than 0.1 for the pug. It means that this limit is viable, is different between the different breeds. And the problem is that some people consider that this limit is a fixed limit. And it must be, for example, 0.3 for all the brachycephalic breeds. If you do that, what is the consequence? The consequence for the dog de Bordeaux is not very important because 0.3 is here. It means that only some percentage of the population will be eliminate, elim eliminated and there are just the one we want to eliminate. They are hypertypical animals. But if we consider this limit of 0 0.3 in the French Bulldog, it's more or less here you eliminate more than half of the population. And I go on with the pug. If you consider this limit of 0 0.3 in pug, you eliminate all the population. It means that this limit cannot be fixed once for all the breeds. It, may, it will change according to the breeds. If you want to change this limit, you must work on the population. And for example, if you want the French Bulldog to have a muzzle longer, you will Favorite, favorize in breeding and in judging the animals which are in this part of the curve. It means between insufficient and good. It is not so natural for judges, for breeders, because they are, they, they are working on these animals with this part of the curve. And I ask them to work here with animals with long muzzle, it means for this character. And if we promote this animal, all this curve will translate, will be translated from the right part of my graphic to the left part. It means that this limit will follow this translation and in few decades, this limit will change in the breed. So it's very important to understand that this limit cannot be fixed for all the brachycephalic breeds, but we must consider each breed as a new breed, as a, a breed uh, independent of the other. It's only for one characteristic I speak about craniocephalic breeds and the craniofacial ratio, you understand that we can generalize my demonstration with all the characters, all the morphologic characteristics which are involved in hypertype. What is clearly the definition of this hypertypical dog? Raymond Tuke says, type of a dog pushed to exaggeration certain characteristics being overdeveloped. The hypertype, team, the hypertype is not called like a childhood disease. It is a result of a long series of insidious deviations. 
you can see here some animals which are of, with overdeveloped characteristics. And what can hypertypes be in a, what kind of characteristic or morphological characteristic? Sorry. Hypertype can touch character and behavior, you know. All dogs must show a balanced character in the showing, as well balance in the life in society. The specific behavior of the respective breeds should be allowed, but excessive shyness, for example, being uh, reluctant or an aggressive character are not desirable. Aggressive or fearful behavior during judging will not be tolerated under any circumstances and will result in the disqualification of the animal. On coats and grooming, the coat must not be abundant as to impede movement and or sight. For example, in the Yorkshire Terry breed, you can see the standard. What does the standard say? Well, say it says for air on body moderately long, perfectly straight, no wary, glossy, fine silky texture, no worry, must never impede movement. It's clear expressed here that normally if we follow the standard, the animal can't fall can fall down in the hypertype. But when you see animal like that, you imagine you are in the hypertype. What is important to have in mind is that hypertype doesn't obligatory means uh, illness. For example, here we are in hypertype, hypertypical animal comparing with the standard but this animal, except it, if he can't fall anymore, uh, has no problem. And it's very easy to eliminate this hypertypical animal. You cut the air and that's all. <coughs> In French analogy, I know a little bit more. Uh, we have never succumbed to the showed up fashion, as we can see in many countries around the world. The title of champion of France must be accompanied by health, character, or use test. It is one of the few countries in the world, to our knowledge, that the requirement has been searched for a long time in France. And we have developed, before the pandemic, a test for brachycephalic animals, breeds. Uh, all these breeds you see here, so bulldog, French bulldog, pug, Dog de Bordeaux, Japanese Chin, Cavalier King Charles, Spaniel, Pink King Kese, Griffon Belge, Griffon Bruxellois, Shih Tzu, and Boston Terrier. A brachycephalic uh, exercise aptitude test for health called breath. And it is nearly the same as other physiological tests. It is not a, a test of effort. It is a physiological test, uh, and everybody knows more or less uh, the animal wo must work 500 meters under six minutes, and we are looking if at the end of the walk there is no problem of breath, no problem of uh, respiration, and all the uh, respiratory system is test. It is for us much better than only the craniofacial ratio. We know that there is a correlation between the, this ratio and the BOAS, but it's only one character. When you test with a, when you test the animal with such a test, you test a lot of characters at the same time. You test the open nostril, you test the long length of the palate, soft palate, you test the size of the tongue, you test the trachea, you test a lot of things. And for us, it's much better than only one character because if you test one character, you have to test another one and, the, and it's very difficult and a long process. 
Hello. So standard does not describe hypertypes. It's very important because normally, as FCI standards are uh, mentioned nowadays, there is no possibility of hypertypes. In general, we can say that there is no possibility. However, we can either, as Raymond Truque said, when he was president of the FCI Standards Commission, that we can't reduce all dogs to the tip medline, rectilinear, a metric. So we must work in each breed. Due to Hélène Denis, some of you knows her, uh, she is a member of the board of direction of the French Canal Club and of the, uh, and she is president of the English Bulldog in France. There are a lot of uh, big work which have been done in English Bulldog, and I, I put here, we can serve, this work can serve as an example. Due to the constant struggle against, against exaggerations, dogs that are too wrinkled, breath, breathless, with a terrible difficulty of breathing, called rasping, the breath is certainly extreme, but the normal bulldog still exists. And this is very important because the breeze is hypertypical comparing with a lepoid animal or with a metric breed. But in this breed, we have also good animals, healthy bulldogs, and this is very important because if we want to make work around healthy animals, we, work, we must work in all the breed with these animals which are able to work, to walk, to breathe, and so on. And this animal still exists in all the breeds. The, other, the example can be developed over other characters, uh, here for the German Shepherd, you see the uh, exaggeration in this animal with the top line very declined uh, in this photo. And what does the standard say? What does the standard say? The top line goes without visible break from the well protruding necks through the well developed withers and from the very slightly sloping back, very slightly sloping back, it means very slightly, uh, to the slightly sloping croup, and it is not slightly, it's very uh, sloping back. <coughs> but what is very important to have in mind too is that uh, what we called before, uh, this doesn't appear and overnight. If you see here a picture at the end of the 19th century, 18th century, sorry, and uh, here at the beginning and the middle of the 20th century, you see the animals which are not hypertypical animals. Since the end of the 1980s, 80, and more after, you see this animal hypertypical uh, clearly. In other breed, and for other characteristics, morphologic characteristics, what does the standard say in Basseund? Skin, loose and elastic without exaggeration. It is essential to keep in mind that this is a working dog that must be fit for its purpose and must therefore be powerful, active, and at great endurance. Loose, elastic, without exaggeration. You see here an hypertypical animal. The air, another time, another example, the case of the English setter. It's an example of deviation of sir, when we forget the use of the breed. In the United Kingdom, we have forgotten, some have forgotten, that this dog can be selected to mother stop in front of the wild, wild game. 
At first, they became show dogs, and the breed is now considered endangered due to the lack of births in this country. In France, it is the flagship breed of the seventh group with more than 7,000 uh, this year. So you see, if we don't fall down in the hypertype and we don't forget, forget, forget the utility of the animal, we can eliminate hypertype or hypertype in this breed. I, present, I have presented this, uh, this breed, I pass, I go through, and uh, for Tibetan Mastiff, we have here animals which are considered uh, hypotypes, but hypotypes in terms of LC animals does not pose a, a risk to the breed, there is no risk for the breed, and these animals, hypertypical animals, have a risk for the, the breed. Here, in other breed, you see uh, the contrast between uh, animals with ear, oh sorry, ear uh, and hypertypically, hypertypical dog. And uh, <coughs> in contrast with the, as this animal, we have animals which are hip, hippo, uh, type, but another time, hippotype animals does not pose a risk to the breed. <coughs> so, who are responsible for that? It's a question we always have in mind. The dogs know, of course, they are the victims of the mad madness of men. The owners looking for a dog to show of more and more and more, and always more, of course, they are in the process, processing of hypertypical animals. Facebook, this morning, Yamastakel told us that we were in a Facebook time, more and more rapid, more and more fast, uh, and uh, you see in the description on Facebook, wonderful, stunning, and it would be rather, best, rather good to see, uh, does he trip over his ring or does he still manage to trot around the ring? And this question, for example, would be better. What are the breeders? We, ask, we called about them who produce this type of dog to attract this customers and make a specific specificity for having spectacular animals. The media, another time. For example, we have in the publicity some hypertypical animals. And if you come back another time to the standards and you see what is written in the standard, for example, here you can see for body folds of skin on body in mature dogs, highly undesirable, undesirable on the, on the body, excepted on wisers and base of tail, which show moderate, moderate wriggling, moderate wriggling. So when you see that, when you see that, there are animals which are presented in the publicity. So people who doesn't know the, the breed discover with this publicity the, the breed. The judges, of course, they are responsible for selecting good subjects for breeding. And you have seen what I called just before with this variability of my curve for some characteristic, morphological characteristics, the judge must make the effort to go between sufficient and good and not always in this part of animal for some subjects, form char some characteristics, characteristics uh, not always in the uh, very good and excellent. Veterinarians, yes, of course. As health practitioners, veterinarians cannot remain insensitive to excesses of the hypertype, even if sometimes the great involvement 
and high degrees of thickness, technicality can make them lose the idea that the breed they are looking after is gradually slipping toward a pathological hypertype. But the profession, as for example in France and in uh, Switzerland, I have two examples, at the middle of the 2020, uh, for, uh, no, 2014 and 2015, uh, has taken conscious of that. I, for example, the name of an article in the veterinary display, hypertype, when the best is the enemy of the good. And later, another article which indicates that uh, hypertyped individuals are ne neither enduring nor irresistible, they are suffer all their life. You can see here, suffer to be liked, no thanks. Here, it's a, a hypertype awareness campaign in the French Bulldog made by the Swiss Association for Small Animal Medicine in 2018. And you see two French Bulldogs, one here with this running under an ear suffocating. And we see the craniofacial ratio here very, very low. We are at under 0.1 because there is no more muzzle, we can say, in this animal. And here, this animal have a long, longer uh, muzzle. And the standard. In the FT, FCI standard, model standard of the FCI, you can see two things very important that I have put here in red. Any dogs clearly showing physical and behavioral abnorm abnormality should, should be disqualified. And secondly, you see here, only functionally and clinically healthy dogs, healthy dogs with breed typical confirmation should be used for breeding. It means with these two sentences, we have normally no possibility if we follow the FCI standard to fall down in the hypertypical animals. I, I say that because very often people say, ah, we have a problem of hypertype in a breed, we must change the standard. It's, 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 it's like a reflex, uh, people say, ah, we can change the standard. Of course, we can if we need, if it's necessary. For example, if the muzzle of a breed change of craniofacial ratio, the standard must change too. But it is not always the only tools, the only tool we have to avoid hypertype in dogs. The standard normally can't fall down into this exaggeration. To conclude, I, in conclusion, it is clear for me that the problem of the hypertype proceeds from reason and must remain a matter of balance. It's always something very difficult. You have this border, this limit I am talking about. This, this limit is not written in the text, in the standard. It's at the appreciation of the Jews, of the breeders. So it's a question of balance. Secondly, some of the hypertypes are pathological, others are not, I've shown you. So what is very important for us here is zoos or zoos who are pathological and it's very important and when they are present they do not arrive suddenly but they are the fruit of a long and bad selection made not in the interest of the animal well-being but in that exclusive of the glory of the human being it is absolutely not a loss because of insofar as all the players in the sector are able to become aware of it. The fact that we are talking about 
this about is the proof of that. Do not forget the history of the breed and the long term. Eradicating a breed should never be the solution to the problem, especially if healthy animals still exist in the breed. It's very important for me to insist on that. We have made a small study. I have time. Yes, five minutes. Uh, a small study with uh, Ellen Denny, I, I've talked about just before, on craniofacial ratio between the end of the 19th century until nowadays with animals which are all champions. We have the photo of profile of the head of each champion, and we have calculated the craniofacial ratio of these champions. What we see is very clear here that for all the breeds studied, they are all brachycephalic breeds, we see the same tendency during all the 20th century. It means that the craniofacial ratio was higher here than nowadays. In each breed, the case is different. I have no time here to develop that, but perhaps a next conference. I have just one example here. You can see that from the end of the 18th century era, beginning of the 20th century, until nowadays, in dog the border breed, we have this animal in this blue zone, which have a long muzzle. And according to the, more or less, at the end of the Second World War, uh, we see these new animals, these new champions, which, are, which appeared. And of course, this animal with short muzzle here, we are in the hypertype, hypertype for this animal, and it's dangerous. As this animal still exists in the breed, it's necessary for us to understand that tomorrow's champions are the, the father, the ancestor of tomorrow's champions are here, they are here, and they are not here. And you see what I called before, or I said before, that in each breed we have some healthy animals, and these healthy animals must be the beginning of the breeding of the future. So, to conclude, I will say that the FCI the Kennel Club, the American Kennel Club, and all the other international Kennel Club have been the heirs of canine selection for a long time. They have the duty to continue the selection of canine breeds and to protect the domestic animal biodiversity. Because it's biodiversity of domestic animals. And nowadays, everybody speaks about biodiversity but they always forget the domestic biodiversity. It's very important to not to ignore it. What man, human being, has made, has selected, man can deselect. But it will take time, several decades. This is important. You have seen the evolution during all the 20th century it's a progressive decrease of the craniofacial ratio. It is not form, form. It's something very, uh, very long, on a very long time, time. This will not happen in a few years if we want to preserve the canine brides. And it's important. We must preserve the canine brides, breeds. Sorry. LC dogs still exist in all canine brides, breeds. They are the one which must constitute the basis of genetic selection of future canine breeds. Canine breeds, sorry, no breeds must disappear. So, last word. I would I would like to say that we don't forget what is the problem. 
The problem is not the breed. The problem is the hypertide. We must fight strongly against hypertide. We don't must to fight to ban breed. Breed are our world heritage. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Dr. Claude. Um, are there any questions for him? I'm sure there's lots, but yeah. Why was this change accepted? In German shepherds, it was a, a serious fault to have a German shepherd with long hair. Now it is accepted, and now it is considered even a different breed. There are short hair and long hair German shepherds to judge at shows. Right, so that is a different thing. For me, it is a matter of amount of animals. When you have just uh, the minority of animals deviating from the standard, we can talk about a, a fault. But when there is a significant part of a breed deviating from the standard, what do we do? We don't have many choices. Either we say this is a standard and we are not we are not budging anything. And most animals do not I mean we do not know what to do with them. They don't have a reason to be. Or we say there are breeders who want to breed these animals. They are interested in it. That's interesting to them. It is a new variety of hair, of fur. What should we do? Because if we are intelligent, we will say, all right, we are not going to, to disregard these animals. We will consider them because they come from this variety from the beginning, which is a new variety that people before hadn't come up with, hadn't invented, you name it. That is a reason why before it was seen as a fault for them. But, for, but right now, when we have a fair amount of these animals, we say, well, you know what? We might take it into consideration, should everyone agree with it, that this is a new variety. And that happens with many breeds. In France, the same thing happens with the poodle, with the caniche, with the poodle. What do we do with this variety that is outside the standard of, uh, of this particular dog? The most intelligent thing to do for me would be to recognize it as a new variety from a new, with a new color, this animal. Instead of making a different breed. We can have a long discussion about this, but this is the problem with this. Coming from a fault, which could be maybe the beginning of a new variety but that is not just shocking on its own the thing is what to do with these animals now if there are breeders now if there are many breeders who want to breed them and this happens in so many breeds this happens in poodles this happens in many many breeds and i think i have many examples to name just to prove your point something that before was a fault turns out to be a new variety now and at some point maybe even a new breed i don't know we, we we're not here for that but what's going to happen with the puddle at the end of the day if we don't acknowledge this new variety we will at least try to acknowledge it as a new breed because it exists and there are people who want to breed this this particular curly-haired dog. And I'm sorry for mixing up all my languages here, but this happens very frequently in the story of, in the history of dogs and breeds, what, what you're asking. Thank you. We have um, time for one more question. afternoon my question comes from what you said 
that we can deselect a characteristic, but what happens when there are there isn't enough genetic variability for this characteristic, and we cannot rescue or go back to the previous variability to the previous variable? Are we creating more genetics by senotypical selection? Well, this is why it is so hard if a type, if an ancient type has disappeared and we want to go back to it, well, there isn't really much we can do. There isn't just the, the only one solution we know is to, to cross breed with another breed with the certain character, but we do so from a scientific approach that is well known with a research project backing it up and of course everyone knows about it and sees it as a goal to recover character and then we stop and continue with the breed but I don't know in a breed that has lost the character that we want to select now and, and start all over or wait for the character to show up, we'll have a seat because you might be waiting for years. I want to thank for the presentation because it was very graphical, very, very cool because it was clear for me to see the hypertypes. Thank you for that. My question is, maybe the judges themselves or during shows or competitions worldwide create hypertypes. Let, let me explain what I mean and you tell me yes or no. For example, there is a type of European and American Golden, and there is a different variety there. Do you think that will trend into a hypertype? So for me, in each variety, we will have hypertypes. To say that a variety is the hypertype of another, why not the beginning? But then each variety has its own existence, its own variability in terms of genetics. So this is a little bit what we said about the German Shepherd. At the beginning, it was a fault in a in a breed or a variety, but this hypertype has been selected. It can turn into another type, not just hypertype, but other types, other varieties, and that is the principle of another variety or breed, still unknown. So that is why it is so difficult to talk about hypertypes. For me, it would be perhaps better to talk about mistypes, mistypes. I don't know, we need to find the words to say hypertypes that cause illnesses. That is a problem we are addressing at this Congress, the welfare and health of animals. Hypertypes by themselves are not a problem. And judges very often tell me, I'm not a judge myself, but I hear often that hypertypes are the loveliest. And you hear that all the time. If there is no pathology, the hypertype is not a problem. It could be the beginning of a different breed. For me, the hypertype that falls into the disease, in, into disease is the subject of today. I want to thank the FCI board members for giving Mexico the opportunity of having this important World Congress for Welfare and Health for the dogs worldwide. We are really pleased and thank you so much for giving us this great opportunity. And also I want to thank all the speakers from all over the world who participate in this great event. Thank you.